Looking at the Markets with David Modell. Welcome to Looking at the Markets with David Modell. Today, my guest is Mr. Russell Rhodes. Mr. Rhodes is a chartered financial analyst, director in the Global Derivatives Group with the SIBO, and author of Trading VIX Derivatives, Option Spread Trading, Trading Weekly Options, and Candlestick Charting for Dummies, and co-author of The Warren Buffett Way. His blog is located on the web at SIBO.com slash blog slash author slash Russell, Russell dash Rhodes. You don't have to type all that in. It's in the link in the description below this video. <laughs> and his Twitter handle, which you must visit, is at Russell Rhodes. All right. After all that, Mr. Rhodes, thank you for joining me today, sir. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm pretty happy to be here. Yeah. Shut that down. Uh oh. Okay. Well, pretty happy is good enough for me. I'm just uh, glad to have your expertise. I've had multiple people tell me you got to get Russell Rhodes <laughs> on your program. Uh, after having uh, such VIX experts as uh, Seth Golden, I'm hoping mm -hmm. to, get, to get David Lincoln, who interviewed you. Shout out to Mr. Lincoln. Hope I'm not stealing your guests <laughs> one by one. Uh, he, I um, think he already put it out there first. So oh, he yeah, that's true. He got me. Man, mm, what can I do? Well, uh, first of all, I, I got there's an 800 pound gorilla in the room, or should I say an 800 pound scar on your forehead? I saw it on Twitter. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, so, would you like to talk about that? <laughs> oh sure. It's uh, you know it, it's funny. Uh, it was a lot nastier looking about a week ago, mm -hmm. and everybody except for one person I work with was too polite to say what happened. <laughs> um, but but it, basically, I was uh, you know it, big cities are dangerous places. And I was trying to dodge a car that was pulling out of a garage. And as I stepped behind it, the little garage gate came down. Oh. And it was kind of like getting hit by an aluminum baseball bat across oh. the head. And oh, no. I, uh, but it, it was nastier than, uh, it looked a lot nastier than it was. Um, I, it happened kind of in front of a, uh, of a, a hair salon uh, where they cut men's hair, but it's all women working there. And they were so nice. They pulled me in and put a <laughs> towel on my head. And one time they pulled the towel back and a couple of girls burst into tears. <laughs> um, but it, again, it looked a lot worse than it, than it turned out to be. And uh, it's just a week and a day old. And I took the stitches out last night and everything's cool. Okay. So, so I even so took, took the stitches out myself. Wow. Oh man. I'm <laughs> a multi-talented Russell Rhodes. That's right. All right. And uh, yes, I'm speaking to an injured Russell Rhodes, but fully functional. So that's the important right. thing. Um, all right. So I did something today and I'd like your assessment on it. I know I'm being selfish here. Uh, we probably both know that the VIX had a nice pop today. Yeah. And yes, imagine that. And uh, UVXY, which is my favorite trading vehicle as of late, went up uh, about 10% at one point today. So... Good. I sold some naked, uncovered, out of the money calls. Yes. Okay. I'll give you the uh, now. I what I used to do. First, I'll tell you how crazy I used to be, and I stopped doing this. I used to sell the weeklies expiring in a few days, um, for that quick turnaround, and I've been okay so far. But I've stopped doing that because several people have told me, Dave, you got You got to stop that. At least sell something that's forty-five days out or so. So instead, this today, um, mm -hmm. when the VIX popped, I sold uh, out of the money UVXY calls, some 28 strikes, some 40 strikes, just for variety, expiring right. March 16. Okay. Where's March, I, you gotta you gotta help me a little bit? Where's UVXY? I was not in front of a screen most of the day today. Okay. Uh, it, let's see. It's around 10 ish. Uh, make... No, it's in the nines. It's been in the nines for a while. Okay. Uh, I thought when you said a you, pop, I thought maybe 10 ish. Um, UVXY is 9.70. You sold the 28s and the 40s? The 28s and the 40s, just for variety. How crazy uh, am I? How crazy am I? Not that bad. You know, you would have some time to react to that. You know, we're not going to. What, what's your mental stop on UVXY moving against you? That's how I would do that. Okay. I would start, that is I'd a start, question. You know, I would. I'd, take a look at where I get a little bit concerned about UVXY moving against me. I mean, but heck, you, what do you need for that to, to hurt you about a 200% move? Yeah. If it's 9.70, yeah. okay. then, then even the 28s, you'd need a, uh, you need it to triple almost. Yeah. In value. Um, 
you know, as long as you're using some sort of discipline stop, if you're going that far out of the money, you know, if you were selling the tens that expire Friday, I'd be oh. still making the cringy face that I was making before. <laughs> um, but I do. It's so I. I actually. Uh, I. I met with um, some fund managers that are st- starting to dabble around in VIX for lunch today, right. and I, I'm probably overly, overly cautious with respect to being short volatility. Sure. Uh, keep in mind, I was at the Options Institute. I've been at SIBO for almost nine years now, which is like a longevity record. Yeah. And uh, for like six or seven, I was the junior guy in the Options Institute. And then I shot up to being the senior guy very quickly. Hmm. But as the junior person, you field the, the what happened to my portfolio calls especially the ones related to volatility instruments, even volatility instruments don't, that people nece- didn't necessarily trade at SIBO. Mm. Uh, and I just heard so many terrible stories about, um, you know, buying VXX because they didn't think VIX could go any lower. And I think, it, hopefully everybody listening understands why that's a silly thing to do. Right. Um, and, and, you know, or being short volatility and getting caught on the wrong side of it, I mean, you, you've you been doing this for a while and you know what it can do. And you know that, uh, and if you don't know, I'm getting ready to tell you, sure. uh, if you take the index that UVXY is, is based on and you backtrack to October 2008, it was a triple. Yeah. So you, you can, you know, and now I'm not saying, I, I like to believe that if we get into a 2008 situation, uh, it will will start to have some signs. You know, October of 2008 didn't happen without, uh, you know, Bear Stearns going under and a lot of other things leading up to it. Uh, and yeah. and so, you know, I think maybe I like to believe, I'm, I'm giving you all kinds of benefit of the doubt here, right. that if, uh, if we started to get into more of a risk on market, uh, you might exit that or be a little bit more cautious about trades like that. But to to quote uh, my predecessor, Jim Bittman, who ran the Options Institute forever, uh, you know, things work till they don't. And what you're doing has been working for a long time. Yeah. I you mean, know, just, just being aware, being aware. It, and yeah. I, I think you are. OK, I you know, I I have not been doing this for that long. I've just been lucky so far. Um, you know, to ha- to be in this melt up of a market uh, has benefited me greatly, but it's not going to be like this forever. Do you see no. any conditions happening right now, macro conditions that would indicate any red flags other than just, quote, the market is too darn high? No, other than VIX um, today in the way it's acting. And, and I, I do some I, I do some work with uh, Mark Sebastian. Uh, and, we're, and we're pretty, he's probably my best friend in the industry as well. And we disagree on what's going on in the market sometimes. And he was 100%, I like that I'm, that I think I'm right and he's wrong this time. Um, he was totally attributing how VIX was behaving last week to the shutdown. Right. And the fact that, I mean, I know that they just pushed it down the road. But, uh, you know, today, you know, the S&P 500 was up 10 points and VIX was flat. Hmm. You know, and, and I know, you know, eventually the S&P took a turn to the downside and VIX took off. But the fact that, that, that VIX is not, you know, going back to the single digits like it was last year uh, makes me wonder if there are people smarter than myself that pay more attention than myself that are seeing some things that I'm not seeing. Yeah. You mentioned. You know, so, so, and, and I do yeah. think that the behavior of VIX it's going to be an early sign. Now, it's head faked us a few times in the past few months, but uh, you know, the, the way it was acting today just uh, that that you know that means people are still putting or still willing to pay up for SPX puts uh, even when the market's going up. Yeah, so they're even concerned when the market's going up, and it always takes more. I know I'm I'm just running all over your words here, but okay. it always takes more than overvaluation. To, to be a catalyst on a sell-off. Right. Uh, and I was listening to some of the Davos people today, and one one person uh, said, you know, it's always uh, the place that we're not looking at that that that, caught, that triggers the sell-off. Yeah. And, and they also said that the tone at Davos was very similar to 2006. <laughs> hmm. uh, <laughs> Interesting. Fair yeah. enough. Um, now, as far as 
trading VIX products and especially uh, people on the long side, uh, mm -hmm. heaven help them all. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I've had thoughts. Occasionally, the VIX goes below nine. And I've noticed that when it does, it doesn't stay there for very long. No. The, now, past performance is not an indication of future blah, blah, blah. But so far, whenever it goes below nine, I haven't done it, but I've been tempted to buy <laughs> some vol products. Well, keep in mind when VIX goes below nine uh, and then it bounces back up, that if you're if you're buying something, it's going to be based on the futures. Yeah. And the futures, uh, the, the curve tends to just steepen and the futures don't bite much. Hmm. when when VIX has been doing that because they see what you see, that yeah. VIX isn't going to spend a whole lot of time under there. What's really funny is if, if we backtracked about, I don't know, 24 months, you and I could say the exact same thing and say, well, whenever VIX gets below 11, because yeah. um, it was doing the same thing, and then it, it just, uh, last year it created a new floor. Yeah, okay. So uh, do you think we'll just keep creating new floors? I remember not long ago, it seemed like average VIX was 15. And yep. now average VIX is uh, barely double digits. Are we just going to yeah, keep creating new floors lower and lower? You know, we've done some work where we play around with uh, the, the formula for VIX and and try to figure out if uh, you know if if so many options are figuring into the VIX calculation, and we go you know ten strikes out and and we increase the price by a nickel as we work our way to add the money. Yeah. Uh, we see like a six or seven VIX. Uh, there's lots of different ways you can play around with it. Um, I did. A, I also ran a model where I um, priced every option that every SPX option that was going into VIX at a nickel, which is the low, which is actually lower than the lowest price that can be used. The lowest price that can be used is um, seven and a half cents because you have to have a bid and an offer. Okay. Uh, but I did that just for the heck of it, and I got a VIX of 1.41. <laughs> now that's a theoretical. Um, but but what I think is actually happening back to uh, people are seeing. I think that uh, you know there are there are people that use. I know that there are people that use VIX as an indication of whether SPX options are cheap or expensive. Yeah. And if they look if they if, you know if they periodically put on hedges, and there are large portfolio managers that will allocate one percent of assets to put on different types of hedges. If they look up and they see VIX, you know, around the low nines, uh, they 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 may say, "Okay, guys, maybe you know, it looks like uh, options are cheap. Let's go put a little bit of money to work in our hedging program." Mm. And that activity right there is going to push VIX higher. Gotcha. So I, I think that is what that's the behavior that you're seeing behind those numbers. Sure. Um, I want to talk about some of your publications. Uh, I'm going to put links in the description below this video to your books. People need to get those if they don't have them already. <laughs> Um, for example, I, I love this title, The Warren Buffett Way. Oh. I, I'm a huge fan. So what, what is The Warren Buffett Way besides drinking oh. uh, sugary soda drinks? <laughs> He's actually got a uh, – and, and uh, Hagstrom, who I was the co-author with on this, yeah. uh, he really is the Warren Buffett expert. Uh, and what he did was he he did the text and I did the study guide that goes along with it, which means I had to learn The Warren Buffett Way. Uh, and and I actually I teach at uh, a university, and when I teach investments, I actually include some of this in the class, so it keeps me fresh. Cool. But uh, there are basically twelve little rules that seem to uh, pop up with everything that Warren Buffett Buffett has purchased. Mm -hmm. Although I can I can give you examples. Uh, IBM is one actually yeah. uh, where he doesn't follow all of them. Typically, about nine or ten of them fall in there. Um, you know the the ones that 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 really uh, that I think individuals should probably pay the most attention to. Uh, if we had stable management for some time, uh, he really doesn't like to change management. Although he did when he purchased Heinz, um, but the continuous buying back shares really likes that, okay. and um, the increase in dividends. Mm. Uh, and there's actually in this. You know, I, I work at SIBO, which we also own. Um, the second largest equity exchange in the U.S. now, um, but uh, I believe the NASDAQ, our competitors, 
have an index or the NYSC has an index called the dividend aristocrats, yeah. which, is, it, which is also an ETF, which we have nothing to do. So this is totally unbiased. Sure. Um, and the rules for the dividend aristocrats are very similar to the financial rules that Buffett would put in place. Interesting. So like we, one of the people working in our social media area is recently out of college and just starting to put money into an investment. And that's where I told him to take a look at that ETF because you know it's, it's blue chip quality stocks that have the ability to keep growing their, um, growing their buybacks and growing their dividends. Yeah. Uh, and if you look in that, I think there's 55 stocks in there. Uh, every single one of Warren Buffett's biggest holdings is actually in that fund as well. Gotcha. All so you right. don't even have to buy the book. You just go look at that fund. You can look at that fund or buy some uh, Berkshire Hathaway. How about that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> there you go. That's it. <laughs> um, now you, you have another book uh, called Trading Weekly Options, which is something mm -hmm. I've made good money doing, and yet I'm getting away from that recently. I actually wrote an article called Weekly Options: Don't Buy Them, Don't Sell Them. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to make uh, friends with you by saying that. But what what are the uh, okay? The reason I, I wrote that article it was mostly just kind of a therapy for myself, um, as because uh, buying weekly options talking you, yourself into avoiding them. Yes, <laughs> uh, it, because as a buyer of weekly options, you're facing that end of the theta decay curve. We've all seen that picture where it just falls off a cliff. As far as selling them, which I used to do because I want to push people off that steep cliff, the other person on the other end of that trade. But when things go go against you, there's such massive gamma risk, and there's no time to manage yeah. it. So yeah. how do you how do you trade weekly options successfully? I uh, you know it. it when I was at the institute and I was I was spending more time on uh, individual uh, you know individual stock options, uh, you know people would always ask me what did I think of a certain option on a certain stock, and I would always backtrack a little bit and say well you know uh, the question you should be asking is, or what you should be posing to me is I think IBM is going to go up uh, ten points in the next couple of weeks, and then we go and we take a look at options. So if you've got an outlook, a very short-term outlook, mm -hmm. um, you know, weeklies, uh, they make an awful lot of sense. Also, you know, a lot of people, when you're talking about weeklies, you're, you're probably thinking mostly about the at the money ones. Um, think about the ones that are just slightly in the money that have no time value whatsoever. Okay. You know, if you were thinking about buying a stock for a two or three day move, uh, you can, you know, I'm not saying that you want to leverage up your whole portfolio, yeah. but instead of buying the stock, you know, you could take a look at buying an in the money, you know, call option or even an in the money put option yeah. uh, instead of taking a long or a short position. So um, I think as a stock substitute, they make some sense. Okay. Um, there are some trades around uh, dividends that can make some sense. It's something I'm doing some work on with somebody. Uh, I'm, I'm, I still haven't been completely brought into uh, the belief of, of, of what we're talking about there. And then finally, I actually used to make this blanket statement that uh, I don't know anybody that does well in the option industry unless they sell options one way or another. Right. Now, that doesn't mean only sell them, but I, I was doing a presentation in Boston and some MIT professor came up to me and he had this, this thing that he was basically – um, on about 20 or 30 stocks the Thursday before expiration, he was buying a whole bunch of nickel calls and nickel puts. And mm -hmm. if he got one move, he was basically making it one or two moves. Yeah. And he was um, three out of four weeks, he was making money off of trading like that. Uh, and good for him. It's it's yeah, not what well, I want to do. <laughs> no, it's not something I, you know, that's, that's, that was kind of my response. I didn't say it to him, but yeah. then when I'm, when I was teaching in a ballroom, I go, now that's great for him. That's a lot of effort. Um, I like time decay. Yeah, me too. I, I like <laughs> having it work for me and not against me. Uh, what, what about the quote, poor man's covered call? Uh, I think this is a great way to use <laughs> weekly options where you buy as a stock substitute and as a way to reduce cost basis, buy a uh -huh. leap option um, and then every week sell uh, weekly uh, they're not really covered calls because you don't own the stock but sell right, sell but options against it what do you think of that method as a way to successfully trade the weeklies 
I think that's a really good method, um, not necessarily doing it on a consistent basis. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a, a great example of, of that saving me. Uh, and, and you got to love people that tell you when they really do stu- stupid stuff. <laughs> right. But uh, after Facebook went public, you know, the stock kind of tanked. Yeah. LinkedIn held up and I'm like, well, good Lord that, you know, I don't, I didn't really see the big difference between the two. So I bought, um, I bought a, like a deep in the money put, uh, I think I paid like 60 for it or something like that. Yeah. And, um, the stock moved about over the course of the several months, moved about 30 points against me. Uh, when all was said and done, because I had sold so many put options against it, yeah. I think instead of losing 30 points, I lost five or six. Yeah. Uh, it was bad. very painful, but, um, <laughs> uh, and then the other thing, and, and I've seen some studies on this, uh, I've heard if you, um, if, if you, and th- this would be really on the call side, but I've seen studies where you do a consistent at the money covered call, uh, on a stock uh, that, that has weeklies. And if you just skip the earnings week, mm-hmm. a thousand times better. Interesting. It's like earnings week is the one that. Um, that, that if you just avoid selling the call during earnings. So when, when you said the consistent selling the short dated option, I'm thinking, yeah, but maybe you, uh, or maybe you go farther out of the money or something like that during earnings week. All right. So Mr. Rhodes, I wanted to ask about the commonly used tactic for earnings options players, okay? A lot of people will uh, sell straddles, strangles, or just vanilla options right before an earnings announcement and then take the trade off or liquidate it the next day. Uh, A lot of people say that's very successful. Uh, What does your research indicate? Well, I've been working through an academic program and for a, I had to do a, a large research project. And what I did was I priced out uh, straddles and strangles around earnings for stocks that had weeklies over a, over four quarters. Uh, I think I did it all of 2015. And the, the rules were the way I decided between a straddle or a strangle was how close are we to a strike? Uh, if, the, if the width of strikes is a point, then if I'm within 33 cents of, of one strike, I'm selling that straddle. If I'm between you know, 33 cents and 67 cents, I'm selling a, um, a strangle. And I'm selling a strangle and buying a strangle. I'm using the bid ask quote. So the prices are a little bit different. Yeah. And I did this and then I exited on the close the following day, uh, 600 trades. And basically after all was done and said, said and done, I lost money equal to about the bid ass spread. Mm. So, you know, I'll backtrack to what I said a couple of minutes ago about having an outlook based on a stock. And, and what I've always found is somewhat useful if you're thinking about selling options in front of earnings, find a stock that moved 10% last quarter, but moves 2% on average. Okay. Okay. Because we all got really short memories. Yeah. And and I found those are great places. And I used to publish a blog um, when I was at the Institute where I would t- where I would show what the biggest, smallest average move and last quarter move was for all the stocks that had weeklies. Uh, I lost my uh, my intern and it's it takes about a day and a half to calculate all that stuff. So right. uh, nobody has chosen to pick that up. Right. But I would find that when a stock had had a large move the previous quarter, uh, there was often an opportunity to maybe you know put on an iron condor uh, that would have break even levels equal to an average move. Hmm. And I, 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 I like doing that. I don't think as a blanket statement, well I know as a blanket statement uh, that it doesn't work because I, I tested it out. Right, gotcha. Hmm. Um, Wanted to talk about your blog. I want people to go and visit your blog uh, if they haven't already. Uh, it's it again. The link is is in the description below this video. Go ahead and click on that. cbocom slash blogs author Russell Road so on and so forth. And I'll put it on the screen as well. Um, I'm looking at some of the titles now. You got your weekend reviews. Those yep. are really helpful. You got the charts. Um, what is the purpose of your blog? And who is your who is it for? Who's your audience? Um, it's basically, I, I, I always do three blogs every weekend, uh, one on VIX, one on the volatility EP, ETPs, and one on the Russell 2000. 
Uh, I probably should throw the S&P 500 in there, but I feel like that's kind of saturated. Right. Uh, I talk. I just give a brief review of what's happened in each of those markets. Uh, and then I always find a block trade that I liked from the previous week and um, you know, just kind of show how institutions are using those different products. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah some, and with weeklies, uh, periodically, like let's, uh, you know, let's say we get a big move in one direction or another uh, between Monday and a Friday. Sometimes I'll go back to Monday and find a trade that people have done with weeklies and we can actually track it from the beginning to the end as well. Right. Uh, it, part of the purpose behind all of that is to make me pay attention to the markets. Yeah. You know, it, it keep, keeps me fresh because there are weeks that I'm on the road for CBOE and I'm not really paying that much attention to the markets. There you go. Uh, it, it's uh, so many people really look to this blog as an informational source. So uh, if you're not checking it regularly, go ahead and click on that uh, link in the description below this video. Also, get get those books. Um, <laughs> they're, they're classics in the niche. Also, go to Twitter handle at Russell Rhodes, where you can see, I'm looking at it right now, a nasty, nasty picture of a mark <laughs> on Mr. Rhodes' forehead. But it's, you know, he took the stitches out, and I think he's going to be all right. So thank goodness for that. <laughs> um, wanted to talk about stop losses, because you mentioned that earlier today when I was so selfishly mentioning my own crazy trades uh, for assessment and evaluation. Um, you didn't beat up on me too badly, uh, which I really deserve. But uh, well. stop losses, I mean, every time it seems, I, I used to use stop losses and I would get stopped out and then get frustrated. It's almost as if the market is watching me, waiting for me to get stopped out uh, so it could just turn right around and, and go back uh, out of the money or, or whatever the case may be. Do you have any guidelines for uh, using stop losses in VIX product trading specifically? Because, uh, and, and by the time I'm thinking about you know, liquidating my position, it's so expensive to do so that uh, maybe yeah. I should just ride it out. What do you think? <laughs> well, first off, I, they have a picture of you down where they trade the UVXY options. Uh oh. They know what your trades are. They, they, <laughs> they're totally gunning for you. I knew it. <laughs> uh, you know, I always say that you get into a trade, or if, if you do things the way that I think you should, um, you typically get into a trade again based on what you're thinking about the underlying. And you, you know, you, you, and it's kind of tough with UVXY, which is something that zigzags so darn much. Yeah. But uh, you know that that's what I would be basing my stop loss on. Uh, I think you're you're kind of setting yourself up for failure if you put stop loss prices in on options. Th those there's so many other moving parts going on there. Yep. You know, you're short. You know, you're short the twenty eights. And um, you put a stop loss order in. Implied ball runs up, but UVXY doesn't move as much as is uh, is as, as it would have taken to cause you some discomfort there. Uh, you know, you basically would. You know, you're getting stopped out probably when you really didn't want to or would not have intended to. On the other side of that, you got to have some real discipline if you're going to use the underlying for your uh, you know for your stop. You've got to you know you got to say. Here's where here's where I don't you know here's where I get out, or you know in your case maybe here's where I roll them up because it's probably easier with UVXY which tends to retrace yeah. uh, to maybe roll something up uh, as opposed to uh, as opposed to completely exiting it because gotcha. you know you're eventually going to be right. Yeah, just give my give the trade a little more time and <coughs> and just just uh, be disciplined about it. I like that word, um, and that's what I'm learning for myself. Um, are there safer ways for people to trade these, to short these VIX products that, that you'd like to recommend, maybe even pe pe uh, for people with smaller accounts? Not everybody has six or seven figures to work with. Right. Um, you know, selling the call spreads. Uh, I like to sell, I think selling call spreads, and, and I think this is just because this is the instrument that I started trading on, uh, but I'm more of a VXX person. Sure. And when you see a 10 or 15 percent move to the upside, I'm taking a look at call spreads and I'm actually looking at call spreads using weeklies mm. uh, because uh, the retracements happen somewhat quicker. Now, if I were, you know, if I if I were just selling a call, I'd probably go farther out like you did. Yeah. That's why I didn't beat you up as much when you <laughs> first said you were selling the UVXYs. I was like, oh, my God, you know, are you selling the tens that expire Friday? That scares the <laughs> heck out of me. <laughs> um, but in, in actually, I think anybody that gets 
uh, started in the VIX space, mm-hmm. um, you know, you, you, that, that's probably the approach that you want to be taking is actually uh, you know, selling a call spread on any, any strength. It'll give you, it'll start to give you a feel for how, um, how these instruments trade. Right. And using VXX as your underlying rather than UVXY is probably a better way to start. Or, or yeah. you know what? Maybe even just buy XIV, buy SVXY if you don't mind the K1 tax form that's going to get sent to you by the IRS. Um, maybe I don't know. I'm thinking just ways to get in to this trade other than what I'm doing is probably a good idea because... It is such a dangerous trade. I remember you you said something to the effect on David Lincoln's uh, interview of you, um, you know, be aware of what the VIX can do, of what it's capable of. (laughs) Can you expand on that statement? Oh, absolutely. Um, You know, VIX went to, we'll we'll go back to uh, October of 2008, VIX went intraday into the 80s and 90s. Mm. Um, we We had a monthly settlement in the mid 60s. Uh, VXX in its own right, I think in October, if it had been around, but we do have that we have the index data for all of those ETPs going back to late 2005. Yeah. So I can show you what they would have done during the financial crisis. And, um, you know, the other side of that uh, is in fall of 2015. Uh, we got a, uh, a volatility event that that took the took XIV and SVXY down quickly. Yeah. Uh, if you had actually in August of 2015. Right. Uh, if you had bought SVXY on the last day of July before that really difficult month, it would have taken you over 500 trading days to get back to break even. Ouch. So yeah. So they do. You know, everybody looks at you know that. SVXY, which was even that year, it was up tremendously. Yeah. But if you bought it at the wrong time, it can take a while uh, to to recoup your losses on it. Yeah. Uh, And and that's because of the environment we've been in the last couple of years. Yeah. uh, A lot of people don't understand how how quickly these things can move on you. And they can. Yeah. And that's kind of my job is to make sure people but through the blog or whatever, make sure people understand what can happen. Um, I, when I spoke with Seth Golden once, he described to me the emotional and financial toll that August of 2015 <laughs> took on his short vol positions. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a gutsy man. He, he layered in more short positions throughout that. Um, mm-hmm. And that was only a six, approximately 6% drawdown in the S&Ps. We're not talking about 2008 or even 2011 here. Right. Um, so when you say be aware of what the VIX is capable of, this is something I need to study more. Uh, and this is something people who want to short vol and get into the trade need to be aware of more. And that means reading your blog, reading those books. One more thing about the books. And by the way, those links are in the description, the Amazon links below. Uh, you've got a I, I love this uh, this title candlestick charting for dummies. <laughs> Should, should yeah. dummies be trading at all? <laughs> uh, no, dummies books are great. I actually, the way I got into writing was I edited, so I'm, I'm the technical editor on a lot of the dummies books. Yeah. And then they needed somebody to, to write candlestick charting for dummies. Uh, and, and I'm actually, uh, I'm actually pretty proud of that book. I've been given a lot of, a, a lot of guff or a lot, you know, a lot of crap because every example that I give, I give an example where it works and I actually give an example of how to tell when the patterns don't work. Right. Right. And I I even had somebody that, that criticizes the book in, in the review on Amazon and says half the examples are trades that didn't work. That's the idea. (laughs) (laughs) That's the whole idea. I thought that was fantastic. Um, and they actually, uh, the, the, uh, that book's been around for a while. Uh, and they even said in the review, they said that, uh, that, that th- somebody needs to come up with a beginner book before you get into the Steve Neeson stuff. Right. Cause he's really done some great work in that area. Uh, Steve actually endorses my book for an intro. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, we, we've spoken about like a good, get your feet wet and then, um, move into, uh, you know, move, move into the more difficult stuff like he does. Absolutely. Uh, excellent books. I mean, I'm glad you have something for beginners as well as the more advanced books, such as trading VIX derivatives, options, spread trading, trading weekly options, and so on. Um, are there any upcoming uh, books or projects we should know about? 
<laughs> um, I'm going to have a few white papers mm-hmm. that are coming out. That's part of my kind of my new role at SIBO. Uh, one is going to talk about it, probably the first one that will come out in the next few weeks is uh, the behavior of the VIX futures going into expiration yeah. uh, and, and kind of quantifying uh, how much they actually drop in the last few days when the, when the futures and the index match up the night before. And they tend to match up pretty closely the night before settlement. Uh, that for for your audience, that'll be the probably the most interesting one. It's free. It'll be on our website. And you'll be able to download it. Um, I'm actually finishing up a PhD program right now, uh, so I am not really supposed to be doing much other than finishing my dissertation. Uh oh. Well, we'll finish. When up. that is done, the next VIX book is is the first thing that I want to do. Very uh, nice. Because it's overdue. That one's a little bit dated. Uh, the, we only had VXX and VXZ when I wrote that one. Right, right. Times have changed. <laughs> um, In fact, I would encourage people to read our blog instead of the book, and I don't get paid if you read the blog. Uh oh. Okay. Hey, and uh, we appreciate the free uh, the free research that you're doing. Not free for you, but free for us to read it and enjoy it. Um, and then uh, finally, because I know you're a busy man working on the PhD, uh, you're you're going to be Doctor Rhodes pretty soon. Uh oh. Look out. Right. <laughs> Look out, folks. Dr. Rhodes is coming. Um, I, I want to just present, uh, maybe have a moment of, moment of silence for VXX, which will be maturing, uh, yep. will no longer be with us in about a year, January of 2019. VXX, yep. I already miss you. Um, I want to have maybe a funeral. But, you know, v, you told me that VXXB is coming. Uh, VXXB the, the, is here. It, it's here. It's here. It's the, been out for about a week. Oh, okay. Um, and in it, it, I mean, they there, there was a press release, but uh, and what I've been telling people to do is VXXB. Uh, it actually has the same NAV as VXX. Um, it, it's um, and they've actually got for institutions. There's going to be a way to roll from one to the other. Yeah. Uh, I think as we go through the year, the liquidity is going to move from one to the other. Uh, it, it's going to be a, a long time of having both out there. Uh, VXXB. Uh, VXX was issued as a 10-year ETN. Mm-hmm. Uh, VXXB has been issued as a 30-year. So in my career, we probably won't go through the another issuing. Right. Um, but they also did one for VXZ. There's a VXZB. And we do have standard options out already. Ah. Uh, the big question that we keep getting, uh, because there are a lot of people like to use leaps for VXX, especially sure. to be short for the long term. And because VXX is going to go go away at the end of January next year, uh, there are not options available beyond January of 2019. Uh, as that's why I tell people to keep an eye on VXXB. Yeah. Uh, eventually, as the volume picks up, I'm sure that we will. Uh, you know, and we we're getting multiple questions about it already. Yeah. Uh, eventually, there will be leaps going out to uh, 2020. Wow. Uh, nice. On VXXB. Well, thank so. you to to uh, Barclays, if I'm saying it correctly, for uh, you know thinking ahead and keeping keeping us short vol traders, um, you know, in, in the money. With. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll tell you, I actually was was in discussions with them about it for almost six months, mm. and I and I was under an NDA, NDA, so I couldn't even I couldn't say a word. Right. I am so relieved that I, I don't have to lie anymore and say I have no idea what's going on. So I'm thrilled that they got that. I just, just kind of, I always forget what I'm allowed to talk about and not talk about. Uh, and I would just wouldn't even touch that one. Yeah. Uh, even to say, I don't, I just wouldn't even, I said, I don't know. And right. Even though I totally knew everything. Right. Uh, in fact, we actually created uh, an education site that's uh, SIBO.com slash vol ETPs, okay. uh, which basically describes all the active ones out there. Okay, I'll have to check that out for sure. Uh, perhaps I'll put that in the description as well so people can check out the vol ETPs on SIBO.com. Very good, sir. Well, I've taken up too much of your time already. Is there anything else you wanted to mention to my audience? or, or uh... No, you know, just um, yeah, it, if you've got questions, don't hesitate to shoot me an email. Oh. Uh, sometimes I get a little bit of a backlog and, and I'm playing catch up, so, catch up on the weekends, so be a little patient with me. Um, but right. I do eventually, uh, eventually I get to all of them. I promise. Uh, d- uh did you want to, uh, provide uh, an email address or do you want people just oh, to sure. cont- It's just my last name, Rhodes at SIBO.com. R-O-H- 
R H O A D S at C B O E dot com. Well, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Uh, right. My audience is very respectful. I hope all of you out there watching there be nice. And uh, <laughs> no, no. Uh, if you have a, a question, uh, you know, feel uh, feel free to use that uh, respectfully and politely. Um, and check out the blog. Check out the books. Um, you know, we're we're going to be watching your blog. See all the research that you've done and we're we've been benefiting from it and we'll continue to do so thank you so much mr almost dr russell (laughs) rhodes you're welcome back anytime sir here on looking at the markets you bet thank you for watching please like comment and subscribe and i'll see you next time